<laughs> That's a nice hat. Did mommy look like that? Children love to imitate their parents. Children learn by imitating their parents. Do you smoke cigarettes? concerned about the cynical attitude of the tobacco industry, that uh, they don't want the Federal Trade Commission to issue any uh, regulations that are uh, going to fear with the economy, as they call it, of the industry. Well, I have admit everywhere that uh, this is a, a big uh, multi-billion dollar industry in our country. But nevertheless, I think uh, it's a pretty cynical attitude if we don't take a, a certain amount of consideration for the fact that the health and welfare of 190 million Americans is at stake. If the cigarette industry's economic power were as minuscule as that of the marijuana industry, cigarettes would surely be illegal now and their sales subject to severe penalty as a health hazard. There is, in fact, no safe cigarette and there is no expectation that one will be developed in the near future. The public must not be allowed to believe otherwise. The quarter of a million early deaths are a little less than a seventh of all of the deaths in the United States each year. At present rates, then one-seventh of Americans now alive, approximately 28 million people, will die prematurely of diseases associated with cigarette smoking. Nearly $300 million a year is spent in the United States alone on television, radio, and newspaper efforts to start young people smoking and continue others in the habit. We cannot seriously expect to make major inroads in people's smoking habits while $300, $300 million a year is being spent to increase the numbers of those now addicted. The situation is though Smokey the Bear had to compete with a campaign a hundred times as a powerful, urging people to start forest fires. Action is needed to limit and counteract this massive assault. The industry we seek to regulate is powerful and resourceful. Each new effort to regulate will bring new ways to evade. Just as the television advertising ban in Britain brought forth an intensified coupon war to promote smoking, Still, we must be equal to the task, for the stakes involved are nothing less than the lives and the health of millions of people around the world. But this is a battle that can be won, and with the commitment that is demonstrated by this conference, with the commitment that all of you show in being here and in your work at home, I know that it is a battle that will be won. Great American Smokeout, Bowen also recommended that all states ban the sale of tobacco to anyone under 18. The cigarette industry's own code forbids promotion aimed at people under 21. But one group targeted by cigarette manufacturers is the black community. And CBS News correspondent Bob Fall has a report on that. Black Americans are smoking more than white Americans, and they're getting sicker from heart disease and lung cancer. Lung cancer is now 50% higher among black men compared to white men. Cigarette smoking is causing an awful lot of deaths in the black community. But in the inner city, the message to light up is overwhelming. The tobacco companies know a market when they see it. You can't get away from it. It's all around us. No, it's not good for the community to have that many boobos around like that because that's enticed the kids to smoke cigarettes. This is the way to stop the traffic on any city street. 
The tobacco industry has also carefully cultivated the black market by sponsoring events like this, which associate smoking with glamour, and by contributing to black charities. Gee, I am so grateful for this. With its gift of $1 million to the United Negro College Fund, R.J. Reynolds is the fund's biggest donor. You wouldn't consider the tobacco industry money tainted in any way? It, it comes to us green. And that's all that counts? That's the important thing for the United Negro College Fund. I'm not going to pass judgment on the tobacco industry. The, the tobacco industry has bought off the silence of black organizations. And in black publications where roughly 20% of advertisements urge readers to smoke, tobacco industry money can mean the difference between staying in business or going under. They're not going to tell the cigarette companies, we're not going to take your advertising because they have too much to lose. So black publications tend not to run anti-smoking articles. WBLS. And black radio stations, afraid of what tobacco companies might do, shy away from anti-smoking commercials. I would be concerned as to whether or not they may ruffle some feathers uh, within Philip Morris. They may decide to spend their advertising dollars on another radio station. If a person is receiving a large amount of money, uh, they will not bite the hand that is feeding them. For example, when we ask the NAACP to discuss the money it gets from the tobacco industry, the NAACP refused. We asked Essence Magazine. The magazine also said no. The topic, said one of its officials, is just too sensitive. The reluctance of black leaders to criticize the tobacco industry perplexes New York's mayor who has chastised them in an anti-smoking radio spot. Leaders in the black community ought to be in the vanguard to protect the black community. They aren't, they say, because other issues are more urgent and because some of them think it is paternalistic and even racist to tell blacks what to do. A notion the tobacco industry encourages. What they're saying is, these people just can't be trusted to look at an advertisement and make the same decision that a white person can make. To me, I think that is a racist approach. But I don't like to be looked at, oh, she smokes. So sessions urging blacks to stop smoking are rare. Efforts to get them to smoke even more are thriving. For now, the winner seems evident. So, say doctors, are the consequences. Bob Fall, CBS News, New York. Center for Health Statistics shows that a greater percentage of blacks smoke than any other group of Americans. Critics say that's no coincidence because tobacco companies spend millions of dollars trying to get blacks to smoke. My brother did it. You know, I thought he was cool and I wanted to be cool, so I, I smoked cigarettes. I am afraid of it, but I'm so addicted that it's hard to stop. For American blacks, not smoking isn't just a matter of choice these days. It's a question of life and death. I think it's a serious, much more serious problem than most of the black people realize. Uh, I don't think, you know, unless you're in a field like I am where we sign death certificates, uh, uh, we don't really know how many people are dying. While black physicians view the smoking issue with growing alarm, critics charge that the tobacco companies view black smokers as a growing source of income. In fact, they say, blacks are the target of carefully plotted and highly specific marketing campaigns. They're particularly honing in on people with the lowest disposable income who are taught that smoking is something that is glamorous and wealthy. And the important thing, too, is there are many streets in black areas where virtually all of the retail outlets have cigarette advertising. It's an enormous, heavy concentration. Critics also point out that in many low-income areas, more than half of the billboards carry tobacco ads. Offers of free cigarettes and cheaper generic brands are an added twist. Mass transit systems used by lower-income commuters are another popular showcase for black-oriented ads. The tobacco industry denies vehemently that they target black groups or any other group. It just isn't true. We advertise nationally to everybody. But the charge is made that these days, the industry goes beyond buying advertising to buying influence. At entertainment, cultural, and sports events across the country, good times mingle with the cigarette message in the form of banners, hats, and free samples. Hey, enjoy the sales, enjoy the sales. And that's not all. The cigarette companies are very fond of portraying themselves as the leading corporate benefactors to such organizations as the United Negro College Fund or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Our concern with the black community goes, predates any question of the uh, issue of 
smoking in health or attempt to use it. And to say that this is something new is crazy. We fund a wide range of organizations, from the Boy Scouts to the YMCA's to art museums to hospitals. But the critics maintain that because black groups are so dependent on tobacco company funding, black publications and leaders tend not to speak out about smoking's impact on their community. Again, the industry cries foul. You get zealots, I will even call them nuts, who engage in a kind of McCarthyism based on statistics which are unreliable, which are contradictory. They know it's going to kill these people and they're willing to uh, peddle cigarettes in any way that will be successful for them to get richer. So the controversy continues, but down in Durham, North Carolina, in the heart of tobacco country, the nation's largest black insurance company is taking action. They've started a stop smoking project sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. About 40% of the black people are less informed, are depressed economically and socially, and I think more of them are smoking. The goal is to help people like Mary Ann Johnson, who finally quit a lifelong habit four weeks ago. I just decided to change a lot of things in my life that I was doing that I uh, could correct at this point to live a little longer, hopefully. Unfortunately, it's a little late for George Nunn, who smoked three packs a day for 62 years. Cigarette made you cough so bad. Every time I, 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 I couldn't hold a cigarette in my mouth, I'd have to take a draw and take it out. I cough so bad. <laughs> he has lung cancer and emphysema. On a more hopeful note, against heavy ads and big budgets, some black education does seem to be working. This teenage rap group composed an anti-smoking song for a school assembly. Smoking cigarettes, but you just catch a camper, got lungs like a tire. These youngsters sum up the message that groups like North Carolina Mutual hope will offset the powerful voice of the tobacco industry. They think they're cool by smoking, right? But as you smoke, you know, your lungs and all this gets weaker and weaker, and soon they'll be laying up in the hospital somewhere. And, well, you can't be cool in the hospital. The tobacco industry continues to believe that the results of scientific investigations to date demonstrate no cause and effect relationship between smoking and chronic diseases. Nonetheless, later this month, Congressman Waxman's open, or committee will open hearings on a proposal to ban all cigarette advertising. Dr. Blum, the EPA study calls secondhand smoke a top-of-the-line cancer causer, a Class A carcinogen. Just how dangerous is breathing secondhand smoke? Well, Paula, it's uh, very dangerous, and I think it's very exciting and important that this EPA report is being released. First of all, it uh, really finally puts proof positive that when we light up and smoke, it's more than just a nuisance to other people. It can hurt them, and especially children can over the long period of time uh, disable them and in some instance kill them. Now we know for instance why uh, when someone says oh I had an Aunt Mary that didn't smoke at all and uh, got lung cancer well it turns out that she probably lived 20-30 years with Uncle Louie in the same house and went to a workplace where smoking wasn't discouraged. Secondly it's very important that employers are now going to have an opportunity to remove like asbestos another carcinogen from the workplace and it's uh, going to probably make it easier for President Clinton to coming into office to sign the federal order uh, that has sat on President Bush's desk for two years, urging that smoking uh, be removed from the workplace. Ms. Dawson's, you've heard what Dr. Alan Blum has just had to say. He says this study is, is proof positive that secondhand smoke can, in fact, be deadly. I know that, that your organization feels the study is flawed, but do you acknowledge that there is any danger at all to secondhand smoke? Well, if we look at the studies that the Environmental Protection Agency reviewed, and there were 30 of them reviewing the evidence on a non-smoker lung cancer and, for example, being married to a smoker, and what 24, 80 percent of those 30 studies indicated was that there isn't an increase in risk. So the vast majority of the studies, including those looked at by the Environmental Protection Agency, um, don't indicate that there is a risk. And the most recent study that was published that wasn't looked at by the Environmental Protection Agency, um, again, the largest study ever conducted, says that there isn't an increase in risk. If that new study is added to the Environmental Protection Agency's database, their risk comes back down to not statistically significant. So I think the Environmental Protection Agency has a lot of questions that independent scientists have been posing over the three-year process of this report that they haven't adequately answered. 
Now, if we go to the workplace, for Ms. example, Dawson, let's give Dr. Mr. Dr. Bloom a chance to, to respond to that. He is shaking his head no. Dr. Bloom. Well, it's, it's very sad. I think this is a, just an example. Uh, it should be very clear who we represent. I uh, represent a small organization of uh, about 10,000 health professionals. Uh, Ms. Dawson is here rec representing a small handful of tobacco executives whose job it is to sell cigarettes. And also 25% of the adult population It's very much, it's very much, it's very much uh, well, I think that's the, the sad thing. People who, from the tobacco industry claim to represent the very people that they're uh, dis deserving and there deceiving, and I think that's a real tragedy. Uh, I don't think the asbestos industry claims to represent the very people they're exposing to asbestos. This is really nonsense. They have huffed and they have puffed for two years, and they've tried to prevent this report from coming out. Statistics are very, very good. The scientific evidence here is so good that even those members of the committee that approved this report, who have ties to the tobacco industry, had to go along with the scientific data. It's that compelling. And I think that the question can be raised to you, Ms. Dawson, or to you, Paula, uh, w would you want the people smoking around your baby? I, I, I don't know very many parents who would. Ms. Dawson, the answer to that question? I think that's up, for the par up to the parents to decide. I, I certainly don't think that I would smoke while holding an infant, um, but that has nothing to do with the issue at hand. I think that has to do with dropping an ash on the small child. But if we're, if we're talking about being Do you say there is no here? risk at all to a young child sitting there breathing the smoke of, of, of a parent smoking? Do you acknowledge that there's any risk at all? The, the studies on that, Paula, are very complicated and, in fact, very confounding. What we find is that there's some studies that show there's an increase in risk and some studies that show that there's not and that a lot of it has to do with socioeconomic factors and a number of other things. So I, I hope think no one would believe a word that Ms. Dawson is saying. Well, this I hope someone would read the Environmental the Protection Institute. Agency report, which says exactly what I'm saying on that issue, Dr. Blum. Yeah. I mean, perhaps you haven't read it yet. No, I'm a physician. I don't know. You are paid to represent the tobacco industry to sell more cigarettes. That's the bottom line here. The nitty-gritty is this is hurting sales. And in the California studies that Professor Glantz has done, there were over $2 million in lost sales last year alone, merely because employers got smart and curtailed smoking at the workplace. In tonight's City Under Siege investigations, that billboard-sized Marlboro man may be about to ride off into the sunset. The state of Texas is settling a lawsuit against tobacco companies seeking to recover billions of dollars and limit cigarette advertising. But don't expect cigarette ads to disappear altogether. Reporter Ned Hibbard gives us a glimpse at what we might see in the future. In the good old days, you could look at an advertisement and tell what they were trying to sell you. That's not always true anymore. Case in point, magazine spreads showing a purple piece of fabric and a pair of scissors, or a set of dentures that seem to have taken a bite from a lampshade. This is what any child in England would recognize as an ad for silk cut cigarette. Get it? Silk cut? When you think about it, not so different from billboards that have popped up recently around Houston. Quick, what's being sold here? Camel cigarettes, of course. You'd recognize that dromedary anywhere. Okay, how about this one? If you look really closely, you can see Winston King printed in tiny letters. Next, what is this billboard trying to get you to buy? That's an ad for Marlboro, and everybody knows it. Yet there's no cigarette in the ad, there's no mention of Marlboro, it's just a, a billboard with the country western theme. Welcome to a new era in tobacco advertising, says Eric Solberg of the anti-smoking group Doctors Ought to Care. And there's been an evolution that you could see, especially with Marlboro, and now we're seeing it more so with Camel. What kind of evolution? Look around. Some billboards remain self-evident. But once people associate the company's logo with the product it represents, the logo can stand on its own. It's worked for many successful companies whose names pop into your head when you see their trademark symbols. Don't expect to see these logos on Texas billboards much longer, though. The uh, tobacco industry has agreed uh, to pull down all billboard advertising within four months. The industry has also agreed to pull its ads from taxi cabs and public transportation. It's all spelled out in a settlement agreement between Texas and Big Tobacco, expected to be finalized at any time. But critics of the industry believe cigarette makers will respond to advertising restrictions with some crafty marketing. You're likely to wind up with something like uh, this French magazine did an, a couple of years ago, Camel Boots. Or how about some Western wear from Marlboro Classic clothing stores? This ad appeared in a Swedish magazine after tobacco advertising was banned. What that enables them to do is to keep the brand name in front of the public. They can then advertise their line of clothing. And there's nothing illegal about clothing. Ads for Marlboro clothing or camel boots may work in other countries, but the message from Austin to tobacco companies is clear. 
Don't try it in Texas. If we have to go to court over this issue, we will argue that a tobacco ad is a tobacco ad, and whether they are advertising uh, camel boots or camel jackets, it is still a tobacco billboard. To hear the tobacco companies tell it, they're eager to comply with advertising restrictions even more severe than those Texas is contemplating. Tobacco industry spokesman Steve Duchesne says if a pending national settlement is consummated, quote, you're going to have to look hard for a tobacco ad. Any second in NASCAR Winston Cup points. Duchesne says that agreement would ban sports sponsorships like NASCAR's Winston Cup, which is allowed under the Texas deal. It would also prohibit tobacco company sponsorship of rock concerts and cultural events like this Canadian fireworks show. But critics are skeptical that the industry is making those concessions without gaining something. We've finally learned there's no way you can beat these people in the advertising game, period. And if you can't beat them, join them. In advertising, that is. Doctors Ought to Care proposes countering cigarette ads with anti-smoking messages. Then the question becomes, who's going to pay for it? For City Under Siege Investigations, I'm Ned Hibbard. In tonight's City Under Siege, MD Anderson Cancer Center is at the forefront of cancer research, but even hospital insiders were surprised to learn exactly where some of their research money comes from. Ned Hibbard investigates in this exclusive report. You think? Graphic art. Children and Christmas cards, that's what comes to mind when people think of the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Every year, the hospital raises almost a million dollars for kids with cancer, selling cards designed by the youngsters themselves. Well, I think MD Anderson is perhaps the very leader in the world on, on finding out about cancer and what causes it and how we can begin to cure it. And when it comes to cancer treatment, U.S. News & World Report rates MD Anderson as the second best hospital in the United States. It wouldn't be such a busy place if it weren't for the many diseases caused by smoking. Even people who are already sick puff away in a shaded area a few yards from the hospital doors. But about one out of every four patients who come here hoping for a cure will instead die because of illnesses linked to tobacco. There was a time when that connection wasn't well understood. When advertisements on the back of Life magazine proclaimed more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. In those days, tobacco companies could downplay the health risks of smoking by associating their names with the medical establishment. But those days are gone, aren't they? Not at MD Anderson. They're taking money from an industry um, that kills 418,000 people in the United States and an estimated 3 million people a year uh, in the world. That industry is the tobacco industry. It's a profitable business, one that reaps billions upon billions of dollars every year. And in 1994, the tobacco companies handed out just under 20 million of those dollars through an organization called the Council for Tobacco Research, or CTR. The CTR's latest report lists 13 MD Anderson scientists who sought out and received grant money from the tobacco companies. According to the report, Four of those studies are still in progress. Most of them are basic biochemistry, basic molecular biology, uh, basic genetics type of things that have very little or nothing whatsoever to do with tobacco. Like this project, which examines the role of urokinase and its receptor gene in invasive colon cancer. The research is bona fide, but it probably won't shed any light on the connection between tobacco and cancer. And that, say critics, is exactly why the tobacco companies are paying for it. The question you have to ask again is whether the research you're doing is as important or more so than the benefit the tobacco industry is getting from using you and your institution's name when they go in front of the courts or when they go in front of the press or when they go in front of Congress. And lately, they've been going in front of all three with regularity. Last year, top tobacco company executives testified before a congressional subcommittee, and much of what they said under oath runs counter to the overwhelming scientific evidence. Cigarette smoking is not addictive. Cigarettes contain nicotine because it occurs naturally in tobacco. Nicotine contributes to the taste of cigarettes and the pleasures of smoking. The presence of nicotine, however, does not make cigarettes a drug. For years, anti-tobacco activists have been saying testimony like that is nothing more than a smokescreen. And now that testimony is also the focus of two Justice Department probes revealed yesterday 
into whether tobacco executives lied to Congress. And there's more fuel for the fire. Last week, the Journal of the American Medical Association, known as JAMA, published its most comprehensive attack on the tobacco industry to date. The authors examined reams of internal documents belonging to the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation. Their findings? Cigarette makers knew 30 years ago that nicotine is addictive and that tobacco smoke could cause cancer. JAMA concludes that there has been a conspiracy within the tobacco industry to keep this information from reaching the American public. And the editors make this recommendation, quoting now, medical researchers should refuse any funding from the tobacco industry and its subsidiaries to avoid giving them an appearance of credibility. For a medical researcher in 1995 to take money from a tobacco company is, is like a detective taking money from the mob. But MD Anderson isn't the only local institution that's receiving funding from the Council for Tobacco Research. Several other branches of the University of Texas system are also sponsoring projects that are paid for by the tobacco companies. So is Baylor College of Medicine. And it doesn't stop there. A survey done by the American Medical Association uh, two years ago showed that over half the medical schools in this country still either accept or would accept funding from the tobacco companies. At Baylor, the issue is one of academic freedom. It's their policy not to limit the sources of funding available to researchers as long as the money comes with no strings attached. Critics say no strings are needed because the only Baylor project being underwritten by the Council for Tobacco Research has almost nothing to do with tobacco. As for the CTR itself, it purports to be an objective scientific body. But MD Anderson's Dr. Joel Dunnington says the CTR is actually little more than a shill. This money is only used as a PR instrument by the tobacco industry. In view of that, why is MD Anderson, Baylor, UT, why are they still taking this money? Um, you'll have to ask the people above me. We tried to, but after a week of requesting a response from an MD Anderson administrator or one of the doctors whose research is funded by the tobacco companies, we were told that no one was available to give us the hospital's side of the story. And Dunnington says there is a reason why the state-controlled institution is silent on this issue. I believe that if our institution came out very, very strong against tobacco corporations, uh, we could have problems in the legislative budget process. Why? Because, Dunnington says, the tobacco lobby has deep roots in Austin, and Austin holds the purse strings for UT. There's nothing illegal about accepting grants from the Council for Tobacco Research, but critics argue that there is something hypocritical about doing so. MD Anderson received a total of $80 million last year for research. Of that, a hospital spokesperson says, about 200,000 came from tobacco interests. A small percentage, to be sure. But for Dr. Alan Blum and a growing chorus of others, it's a matter of principle. If we have people beating around the bush, much less taking money from the tobacco companies for more research, then we're in deep trouble. Maybe someday, Blum hopes, MD Anderson Cancer Center will truly be, as the sign proclaims, smoke-free. For City Under Siege, I'm Ned Hibbard. Last night, City Under Siege reported exclusively about grant money flowing from tobacco companies to MD Anderson Cancer Center and other local medical institutions. Tonight, Ned Hibbard investigates where else those dollars are going and why some people are concerned about it. For artist John Biggers, this exhibition is something of a homecoming. Biggers is a former Houstonian whose paintings, drawings, and sculpture are now on display at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Images of Africa saturate his canvases, but for some people, the artwork is overshadowed by another image altogether. The highly recognizable brand name cigarettes sold by the Philip Morris companies. The same Philip Morris that's sponsoring the Biggers exhibit. And Dr. Joel Dunnington, for one, says, Tobacco and fine art don't mix. As an assistant professor of radiology at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dunnington has seen what a lifetime of smoking cigarettes can do to the human body. It's a product that when used exactly as intended, kills people. And they've known it kills people for at least 40 years. That accusation is just one of many leveled at tobacco companies by JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Here's what the journal's editors said last week. The evidence is unequivocal. 
The U.S. public has been duped by the tobacco industry. We should seek the removal of this scourge from our nation. But what JAMA calls a scourge, the Museum of Fine Arts calls a benefactor. Museum director Peter Marzio says it's his job to raise money, not to get immersed in politics. But as long as ta tobacco is legal and you have high quality companies, in this case Philip Morris, which is truly a great corporation, the board is, is entirely supportive. I understand you've gotten a lot of flack about this. Well, we haven't gotten a lot of flack. There's, there's one small group that uh, tried to disrupt the opening and that's been the only flag. Marzio doesn't mention this letter he received just after the exhibit's opening ceremonies from Houston City Council member Eleanor Tinsley. I wrote him praising the uh, exhibit, but expressing my dismay over uh, their accepting corporate contributions from Philip Morris. Tinsley accuses the cigarette maker of targeting women and minorities. An activist, Deloyd Parker, agrees. Parker has known John Biggers for many years. He says the African-American community should be sponsoring the artist's exhibit, not Philip Morris. I support Dr. Biggers, but I do not support Philip Morris and Tobacco Company. In fact, I will continue to fight to get rid of them as far as their business is concerned because of what they're doing to our community. What the tobacco industry is doing, says Parker, is visible from almost every street corner. In predominantly black neighborhoods like the Third Ward, most of the faces on the cigarette ads are young, healthy-looking African-Americans. And Parker says supporting a black artist is just another way for Philip Morris to promote its own agenda in the black community. That's a claim the museum's director disputes. Apparently, the use of tobacco by younger members of the African-American community is significantly lower, so that suggests to me almost the opposite. But there's a potential market there, perhaps, is another way of looking at it. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. In response to Councilmember Tinsley's letter, Marzio wrote one of his own, calling the cigarette manufacturer a corporate leader in race relations. Tinsley scoffs at that. She says the Philip Morris sponsorship simply sends the wrong message. It's saying cigarettes are all right on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, it's against the law to smoke in every public building in the city of Houston, including the Museum of Fine Arts. The museum's director wouldn't say how much money Philip Morris put up for this exhibition, but he admits it's a substantial sum. And if you don't think the tobacco companies would ask the museum to return the favor someday, think again. It happened in New York. The, all the major art museums went to the defense of Philip Morris against the, the banning of cigarette smoking. Why? because the tobacco company threatened to pull its headquarters and its grant money out of the Big Apple if New York City Council passed the smoking ban. Philip Morris executives asked museum administrators to put in a good word with city officials, and several of the museums pulled what strings they could. The law passed anyway. It took effect in April, and Philip Morris hasn't moved out yet. But some Houstonians are worried something similar could happen here. Philip Morris money goes to the Houston Grand Opera as well as to the Museum of Fine Arts. And former Post columnist Juan Palomo believes it's only a matter of time before those organizations are asked to go to bat for the tobacco giant. And they're going to do it because they're, they're, they're hooked on that money. It, it's, it's, it's like the habit, like it's almost as bad as cigarette smoking. There's nothing illegal about taking contributions from Philip Morris or any other tobacco company. But Dr. Alan Blum insists it's not a question of laws. It's a question of morals. Uh, just because it's wrong doesn't make it indefensible, because it's legal. You know, we're saying just because it's legal doesn't make it right. For City Under Siege, I'm Ned Hibbard. Last week, we examined the proposed tobacco settlement, which is an attempt to reimburse states for the cost of caring for terminally ill smokers. If you saw the segment, you remember that much of the agreement targets the marketing of tobacco. Tonight, we're going to talk to a pioneer in the fight against cigarettes. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Alan Blum, founder of Doctors Ought to Care, or DOC. Welcome, DOC. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. How and why did you start this organization? Well, DOC was started 20 years ago uh, by three family physicians in training at the University of Miami. And what we wanted to do was to laugh the pushers out of town. We didn't want to just wag our fingers and do the same old don't smoke and don't drink and all that. We realized that people weren't listening to that, so we created an effort that would satirize and uh, make fun of the real promoters of bad health, the tobacco industry, the alcohol industry, and the other purveyors of unhealthy products. 
And you, you found that humor works much more effectively, didn't you? Exactly. So that, for instance, instead of the Virginia Slims tennis tournament with uh, Billy Jean King and so forth, we created the Emphysema Slims uh, with the slogan, you've coughed up long enough, baby. And we have Billie Jean Butthead and Martina No Smokanova and Emphysema Garrison and uh, Monica Sellout. We get the Baylor medical students to dress up in tutus and play a tennis tournament for the kids in the schools, the high schools and the junior highs, and they love it. The kids see that the real pushers are not uh, other than the tobacco companies and the alcohol companies. And, and obviously you've been very effective because yours is a national organization based in Houston. We're the only national health organization located right here in Houston and I think that's a testimony to the fact that we don't go after the obituary pages you know like some of the other big voluntary health agencies and look for bequests and all that. We really just survive on the ten twenty five dollar donations that people have given us over the years because they like our sense of humor. We have uh, the Barfboro barfing team instead of the Marlboro adventure team. We get the, the junior high school kids, particularly in the high school kids, permission to laugh the pushers out of town. Now we're moving on to try to create a museum in Houston that will tell the whole story of the whole horrible tobacco issue from what we call it from seedling to tumor. And um, you, you showed me some, some articles, some magazines about the advertising and what it does. Could you, could you share some of that with sure. us? Sure. I think, Patricia, a lot of people think that this settlement that has been uh, negotiated between the tobacco companies and uh, plaintiff's lawyers are, are going to, is going to really change the whole issue of smoking. For instance, they're going to get rid of Joe Camel. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen the latest issue of Rolling Stone, but uh, if you just look and take a typical example of the kind of advertising that you're going to be seeing, it's, uh, I don't know, if I were a tobacco company, I think I'd rather have uh, her than, uh, than Joe, Joe Camel. I mean, right. you know, this isn't exactly uh, uh, unenticing to people. And, you know, more power to the tobacco companies if uh, uh, this is the you kind of uh, a approach. A beautiful woman. Yeah, typical um, ad. I mean, that, or it'll be yeah. a sexy man. So the, 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 the people at R.J. Reynolds are in a little bit of a difficult situation. If they say they're putting cartoon characters in cigarette ads, then people say, oh, you're going after children. So if they put adults in cigarette ads, they're saying, oh, you're going to make it forbidden fruit. I think the tobacco companies have always been ahead of us. And to try to prohibit them has been a, a moral crusade on the part of a lot of people in the voluntary health agencies. But that's not exactly the way I think that we're going to uh, deal with them. For instance, this is the latest of the Winston ads. Notice that there's no imagery whatsoever, just some lips. And, lips and uh -huh. it says, kiss cigarettes with additives goodbye, but rinse your mouth out before you taste ours. So they're appealing to people uh, on the basis of the quality of the product, not on any image. And my colleagues in the anti-smoking movement probably won't know what to make of this because they've never studied the advertising. They don't understand that the First Amendment gives manufacturers the right to do whatever they want as long as it's a legal product. They spend almost all of their time trying to wag their finger and say we must ban things that we don't like. We'd much rather laugh at it. And you, you, have, you have been very successful um, in, in stopping that, that sort of thinking and that uh, advertising is going to go away and with the settlement it'll, it'll change and that's not going to happen. I, th I think the Nothing's settlement, gonna change. Uh, nothing will change because the settlement is basically between lawyers who are going to make a lot of money right. and tobacco companies who aren't going to lose a whole lot of money. I think the shame should fall on the American Cancer Society and their allies for trying to pretend that they are crusaders against the tobacco companies. They've, nothing has been accomplished here. Uh, they don't know how to reduce demand for smoking, so we're going to try to make the tobacco companies pay. Where is the money going to go? It's going to go to public health types who don't know what to do. We should turn it over to the business community, which really could see the devastating impact of, of tobacco in our society. Okay, well, thank you very much for, have, for, for being here tonight with us. Thank you very much, Patricia. Edition. I, I am interested in the sociology of the tobacco industry and whether now with the heat on tobacco, whether coming to the college campuses, I know you haven't been interrupted in that, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether that might be a little bit touchy these days, given all of the heat that the industry has taken in the mass media. Actually, not at all. Um, you know, we're very um, honest about what we do. Mm -hmm. And we're, we know what we, the product we have causes harm. Right. So that's no surprise to anybody, to so You're you going to say that me. tonight? To yes. The, yeah, I yeah. mean, well, I, won't, I will say it at the information session tomorrow night. Right. Tonight's more of like a more casual, let's get to meet you. Right. But at our information session, like we did um, classroom presentations on campus at the business school. And that's one of the things we talk about. We know we have a product that causes harm. Um, and, you know, 
we we are honest about that. Now we haven't always been honest about I that. I know, and, and I think Steve and I have talked about that oh, over yeah. the years. I think he's done a great job yes. in changing the image. Our culture but, has definitely changed. But I guess in a way, in fact, I'd actually say that you've almost taken over the the smoking cessation area by virtue of the television. But really, it's a little disingenuous when we don't say what smoking really does to you. That's the problem. It says it causes harm, but you know, I take care of patients with lung cancer and heart disease, right. and it's, no, it's not a pleasant task. Right, it causes a lot more than just that. It causes right. harm in a lot of areas. You right. know, it causes, you know, high blood pressure, it can mm -hmm. cause stroke, I mean. It can cause. Right, it not can Not everyone cause. who smokes gets disease. Exactly, that's right. why, if, 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 for example, if we said cigarette smoke causes just lung cancer, right. then we would leave out all these other things. So we say it causes harm because that includes a lot of different things. And, and every person who smokes, it doesn't always cause cancer. So we have to be broad about, hey, it causes harm. Everybody knows that you can potentially get lung cancer. Are you looking to recruit folks that are going to go out there and really be in love with a product and, and, and sell it and say, you know, people have a free choice and yet I'm... No, I'm... no. We are looking for kids. Uh, part of our mission is being responsible, effective, and respected. Mm -hmm. Okay? And what we are doing is we're looking for people that can handle the responsibility mm -hmm. of marketing a product that causes harm. I just felt though, in this instance, college students might not be as sophisticated about just what they're getting into. Right. And that's why our, our interviewing process is very long and very right. rigorous because mm -hmm. we want to make sure that they understand mm -hmm. what they're doing. Yeah. Um, we Tonight we'll meet them. Tomorrow night we'll have another information session we go into detail we'll have a pre-screen a panel dinner a panel interview right. a day in the field and then an offer so there's several opportunities for them to meet us to learn about the industry from different angles but to make sure the, they're smart about what what's the ultimate paradox here you got people like me who's a physician who fights smoking well in a way if you'd believe the Philip Morris ads they're fighting smoking too exactly well but you're not saying what the things are about smoking that are really bad you're saying it causes harm and, but if logically we're all fighting smoking and smoking's going to decline what's in it for the recruit what's in it the future but, I mean we all we aren't just right. I mean we just spent 300 million dollars on a research and development center that we're creating right now right. I mean our Safe goal for cigarettes well no 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 our goal is to, to not just be in the tobacco industry 20 years from now oh. but to come out with other products in the, in the like future. the medication kind of, inhalers or things like no, that to be more like a PNG you know PNG started with soap and now they're right. selling potato chips I mean that to eventually come off of um, tobacco products because oh. we know that that eventually there will be no future in tobacco products. Well, that's so good to hear. Products, yeah, right? What is it in your mind that says, no, this is all right? You know, this is this was the biggest, this is the biggest thing I debated coming into the company mm -hmm. was, my sister's worked for the company for 18 years now, yeah, and recruited me right out of college, and I was like, ah, I don't want to work for a tobacco company. There is absolutely no way I'm working for a tobacco company. But I did know a lot about the organization as a whole. And, um, you know, once I started to learn, I worked a couple other jobs, and she really worked on me, and she started showing me a lot of, um, really their focus, their mission, you know, their values, um, the things they focus on, and what shocked me was that those values lined up with what my values were. And I feel like if I'm going to be a part of an organization that sells a product that harms people, causes all kinds of diseases and you know issues with, with people's health, that I want to make sure that company is very responsible about how they do that. But can't um, any company produce a mission statement that, you know, I'm Yeah, sure but not every company lives by it. And I assure right. you, I work for this company. Everything I do right. is based off of those things. Every performance appraisal I write for my people, every time I walk in a store and evaluate how my people are handling their accounts and where our product is, every time we do something, it is so ingrained right. in us. I mean. Integrity, trust, respect, passion to succeed, creating um, uh, long-term value, all those things are part of what we do. But if Marlboro sales go down, you're out of a job. Yeah, but, I mean, realistically, that will take some time. I'm aware of that. Yeah, real, yeah. I mean, and that's, we live in a realistic right. world. Yep. You know, it's no different than, than alcohol. You know, pe adults are allowed to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And if they're allowed to make a choice, I want to make sure that I am making, helping them make a responsible choice, does that the, they know what they're choosing. The if, if, if I worked for a company that hid behind, you know, the truth, Mm -hmm. You know, and didn't what Don't get me started. right, and they weren't right. honest. There is yeah. absolutely no way I could work for them. But the integrity that I've seen mm -hmm. with the people that I work with, and I don't, and I, I don't mean that just you know, oh, we just say these things. Right. But I've seen it with my own eyes. I couldn't work for a company that didn't. Well, I guess. Didn't do those um, items, what about we, your sister, though? Done. Without speaking for her, did you ever go back in time and say, man, you must have been working in a totally different environment? You know what? Actually, I absolutely did. I went to a when you become a manager, you go to a leadership journey mm -hmm. where they send you off for a week 
and you really, they try to develop you more as a leader. Right. And um, we were talking about kind of the culture of Philip Morris, and, and I asked that question. There was a guy that had been with the company for 20 or so years, and I said, how in 95, you know, when you watched on television, CEO put his hand up, you know, how did you work for an organization right. that lied like that? And he said, you know what, I was on the verge of quitting. You know, I was, he was like, I was contemplating all of those mm. things. But he said, we begin to make progress and change. And that's what kept me around. He goes, but you know, it, it was a tough time, I think for everybody, because our stance on things was, you know, not to come right out. You know, I watched our, C, our, our um, uh, president, our vice president, President of Sales and Marketing come on campus just two weeks ago, and when he got up in front of students, the first thing he says is, "What do you think's tough about working for a tobacco company?" Huh. And kids were like, "I don't, you know, who knows?" It's like we sell a product that harms people. Yeah. You know, came right out with it. Right. No, and so when I see that as an example, it's like then I know it's okay for me to talk to you about these things. Will the Marble Man be back? You think? Absolutely not. Really? Yeah. So it's gone. Yeah. Do I have a pencil? No, he died of cancer. Died of ca oh. I don't know that for sure. I think that's the rumor, but I don't know that for sure. Yeah. But yeah, we, yeah. the cowboy one, man, isn't. Re it's not responsible. One theory We is, don't want to pull children at all. If you lose tobacco as a whole in this country, it will devastate economically the country. I mean, tobacco farmers, guys are working in operations, taxes from, from cigarettes. And so I think it's going to have to be something that we slowly get out of. And that's just, you know, that's just me talking off the top of my head right. because it's, I mean, you think about excise taxes. You know, you know how much money Philip Morris alone pays in taxes? I mean, that's a lot of money. Wasn't the master settlement, though, pretty much a back tax? I mean, yeah, that's yeah, we pay that on the back. Right. That and doesn't include city, county, state taxes. Yeah, right. You know, like New York, $7? Seven, $7. $7? Yeah. yeah. And it's I mean, going up. They want another buck and a half. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's just come out in the and last you know how much money? California wants another buck and a half. Yeah. Well. So. No, I know I'm not for taxes. I never have been. Uh, it's punishing people. For, you know what? It sets us up. It sets us up to fail because what happens when you know it really does decline? Tobacco sales really does. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that money that they are looking mm -hmm. for for running the city mm -hmm. is not there. Right. The public entrusts the Food and Drug Administration to evaluate the safety and efficacy of medications. Having served on an FDA advisory panel, I have sympathy for the overextended staff at this beleaguered agency. But placing the nation's most lethal consumer products, cigarettes, under the control of FDA would be unwise. And asking a Food and Drug Bureau to promulgate product safety standards for cigarettes is an oxymoron that will perpetuate the myth long fostered by the tobacco industry that this inherently harmful product can be made safer. The promotion of this bill by Philip Morris USA, maker of Marlboro, and by far the biggest of big tobacco, with 50% of the market, should prompt skepticism about the measure and its purported public health benefits. Although the bill will strictly regulate new and potentially less hazardous, non-combustible tobacco products, it would not apply these standards to the most harmful form of tobacco, namely Marlboro and other cigarettes, which cause the deaths of nearly half a million Americans a year. And although the bill bans candy flavorings, and no doubt will get rid of the term lights and will have new, bigger, and improved warning labels, it does not require the FDA to eliminate menthol, the mint-flavored anesthetic agent added to the brands most heavily targeted to African-American and Latino-American consumers. Nor is there a mandate for the FDA to eliminate toxic gases, including cyanide, or the more than 40 known cancer causers in cigarette smoke, such as benzene, nitrosamines, and radioactive polonium. The bill will most assuredly cause confusion about the difference between reduced exposure and reduced harm. If consumers are told that one, two, or even 22 cancer causers in tobacco smoke have been reduced, they are going to assume that a problem has been taken care of. They are going to believe that cigarettes are safer, and they are going to continue to smoke. This is, of course, deja vu all over again. For more than 70 years, every report on the dangers of cigarette smoking was disputed by the tobacco industry, who claimed more research was needed and who promised to identify and remove any component of smoke that was found to cause disease. This led to marketing gimmicks to allay public anxiety about smoking, such as filters that promised double-barreled health protection and claimed to be just what the doctor ordered, or in at least one instance, was made of asbestos. In spite of the fact that the cigarette filter does not confer any reduced health risk whatsoever, 
More than 95% of persons who smoke buy filtered brands in the false belief that they are safer. Yet this bill will not ban the filter, the biggest and longest running scam of big tobacco. Similarly, when the Federal Trade Commission mandated that tar and nicotine levels be printed on cigarette advertisements, tobacco companies were only too happy to oblige. Carlton is lowest. It's official, confirmed by the US government, now is lowest. To this day, hardly a day goes by when a patient doesn't proudly tell me, but doc, I smoke Marlboro Lights because it's got only one milligram of tar. I try to tell these young ladies that they're being duped, but they don't want to believe it. Few consumers have caught on that such numbers mean nothing. History has shown that the tobacco industry has circumvented every attempt to impose federal regulations on cigarette marketing. The goal of the Cigarette uh, Advertising and Labeling Act of 1970 was to remove cigarette ads from the broadcast media, but no sooner had the commercials ended than televised sporting events began, such as NASCAR Winston Cup racing, and the Virginia Slims women's tennis circuit, providing even greater cigarette brand name exposure than ever. We still see Marlboro logos on TV auto racing worldwide. Research has documented that the kinds of marketing restrictions imposed by this bill are not effective in reducing youth exposure to cigarette advertising. The proposed FDA bill will simply change who is committing consumer fraud. Currently, it's still the tobacco companies marketing reduced tar and nicotine cigarettes in a way that deceives consumers into believing that these products are safer. If the FDA bill is enacted, then the government will be doing the dirty work for the tobacco companies. Small wonder why Philip Morris embraces this bill, which will permit it to tell consumers that it's complying with strict product safety standards, making government approved cigarettes. In summary, there is no evidence that this bill will save any lives at all. It goes from A to Z without telling us how B to Y are going to work. To the contrary, the bill will perpetuate great harm through its grandfathering of high-risk cigarette products, its hindering of the introduction of reduced-risk, non-combustible tobacco products, and its eliminating litigation for consumer fraud. However well-intended, the bill is misguided. It could well be renamed the Marlboro Protection Act. It should carry its own Surgeon General's warning. This legislation is deceptive, and it will prove devastating to public health.